Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season four, episode 14, titled Baseballs of Death. I'm disappointed. There was no <laughs> baseballs in this. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on February 19th, 1988. It is written by Peter Lance, who also wrote Rising Death. He likes death. 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 Mm. <laughs> of death. <laughs> He's still got two more episodes coming. Now, this guy's actually pretty interesting because he is the original producer for 2020. Back wow. in 1978, 1978 to 1982 is when he was the show's producer. He also wrote the story. Damn. Oh, okay. So he's got another tie-in. The director is Bill Duke. Now, pals, you might be thinking to yourself, that name, man, that name sounds so familiar. Bill Duke. I love the 80s. I love 80s action movies. Why does Bill Duke ring a bell? Well, that's because Bill Duke is a director and actor who popped up in a couple Schwarzenegger flicks called Predator and Commando. You know, just these little movies. Little no, tiny one, ones. no one really knows them. <laughs> you know, he didn't witness Jesse Ventura all- be killed by the Predator and then pick up the Gatling gun and mow down an entire section of the rainforest. It, you know, hey, he's, so he's little. fun journey here. He also directed some episodes of Hill Street Blues. Stay with me because that's going to be a theme in guest stars. <laughs> His first movie was Car Wash. In 1976. Damn. I love that movie. <laughs> the next movie he played he would play a gay pimp in American Gigolo in 1980. Also a great movie. Immediately following, he would do Predator, Commando, and then Action Jackson. <laughs> hey, Action Jackson is also in theaters this week when this episode comes out. And Predator is, if I will argue with people and say Predator is the best action movie of the 80s over Die Hard. Okay, well, we can't talk about that today. (laughs) We don't have enough time for that discussion. That's going to be a big one. (laughs) So so some other movies you might know him from. He was in Mel Gibson flicks Bird on a Wire and Payback. He's also directed some stuff. He directed the TV movie The Killing Floor. His first real movie, like film movie, uh, that he directed was A Rage in Harlem in 91. Then Deep Cover in 92. Hoodlum in 97, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit in 93. <laughs> That's so the he, was, <laughs> <laughs> he also made a lot of TV appearances. He was in episodes of Kojak, Lost, Battlestar Galactica with Edward James Elmos. And he even appeared in a Busta Rhymes music video for the song Dangerous. Nice. When I saw this was Bill Duke, I did it. I was like head scratching like, Bill Duke, Bill Duke. And I was like, oh, shit, it's that Bill Duke. You know, Commando, Predator, Axon Jackson, and Menace to Society. That Bill Duke, that grab you, pull you down into the bushes. Carl Weathers, get real close. I'm like, look, there he is right there. (laughs) Pointing up into the trees. (laughs) (laughs) I was so excited when I found out that Bill Duke directed this one. It's funny because earlier when you texted me about Bill Duke, and I was thinking, like, why that name sounded familiar. And when I Googled it, I realized, like, I just watched Payback, like, last week. <laughs> the man is also a giant. Yes, he's very large. <laughs> yeah. Before we get started, I can check in, so what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, Hollywood has gone crazy, crazy with the remakes. We've talked about a whole bunch of the other remakes that they've come up with before, but this time... It's a step too far, and I tried to draw the line at Point Break, but they kept going. Now, this is the (laughs) new line right here, right past Point Break, Overboard. The Overboard remake just hit theaters. Now, they buried it behind Infinity War, probably pretty good, so that no one will remember that this movie ever came out, because no one will ever remember anything that came out the same weekend as, as Infinity War. Remember, the original Overboard has Kurt Russell. You cannot remake anything Kurt Russell is in. Also, it is go- off limits. Also, Goldie Hawn, yeah. who he was, ma- who he's married, not married to, who he's been with for a long time. So that's a great movie. Why would you want to remake that movie? And it was, leave it alone. <laughs> I just wonder of all the Kurt Russell movies why they chose Overboard. I mean, I'll admit the commercial does make it look so pretty funny. So I might end up, you know, seeing it once it's available to me free. But um... <laughs> Tom's like, I'm not going to front. I'm going to watch it when it comes out. But. <laughs> I'm not going to pay in the movie theater. <laughs> I'm not going to pay real money to see that. <laughs> I got someone else's Netflix log in. I'll see it for free. <laughs> like I said, there is 
everything Kurt Russell is off limits, right? Yes. Escape from New York, The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China. God help you. God help you if you hey, touch hey, Big Trouble in hey, Little China. I got a question, yeah, I though. Okay, you said Escape New York, but what if we remade Escape from L.A.? <laughs> I mean, it's just a continuation. You can't touch Snake Plissken. That's what I'm saying. You can't touch Snake Plissken. Not even, you know, if it's like Snake's kid, <laughs> Junior. <laughs> what about Captain Ron? Can you do that one? <laughs> I said, no <laughs> Kurt Russell movies can be remade. In- <laughs> I can't so- have an executive decision. <laughs> So uh, the only thing that's interesting on. about the the only the thing rock inter- crawling from one airplane to the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the only thing that's interesting about the remake is that they chose to put an actor in it. it he, I don't know his name, but he's a Mexican actor, and he's the one that had had a big hit in in, in the United States. Mm. That it it was an a, it was like a Spanglish movie. It was mm. English and Spanish mm-hmm. in it together, and it it went number four at wow. the box office. Wow. Okay. So mm. why do we keep burying these good actors in stupid? No, and that's why it's disappointing. But he's like he's a really big star in Mexico, mm-hmm. and he had like a romantic drama or comedy that they they made here, and it and it was like number four at the box office. Why do we got an Adam Sandler every every foreign actor? I know like. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Latins, <laughs> <laughs> that transition was smooth. <laughs> so this episode is cons- is often considered for people to be a, one of the worst episodes, and I have a feeling. Really, we are going to turn <laughs> that upside down in this one because I think unanimously we're going to say, "Hey, you know it's all right." I didn't think it was that bad. <laughs> Oh, no, no, you're going to get thumbs up over here. Uh, in fact, I think the general might be the greatest criminal they've ever faced. Had he just <laughs> booked an earlier flight, he would have right? <laughs> been clean. Actually, they didn't stop him. It was the mechanic who forgot to fill the tank <laughs> that did him in. <laughs> like, I was like, by the way, I didn't put any gas in that thing. You can't uh, go anywhere. Not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, let's go talk about this one because we're going to flip the Miami Vice world Upside down, just like we love Nookie. <laughs> Let's go talk about this one. <laughs> All right, so we open up on Hooker Road again. Uh, Hooker oh. Road. <laughs> it's been so many weeks since we've seen you. We've had so many stupid, pointless stories in between the last time we saw you. And here we are, just as fantastic as we remember, too. <laughs> Really the most 80s scene of the season so far with the guy carrying the massive boombox on his shoulder. <laughs> yeah, the boombox the size of a car on his shoulder. Yes. Another man selling gold chains, a homeless person cleaning windshields with newspaper, hookers walking up and down the street in every direction. It's a cornucopia of fun down in downtown Miami. My favorite part was the old lady who was scoffing at all the hookers. Like she was like, oh, I can't. Well, then what are you doing on Hooker Alley with your husband? Don't take your old husband down there to Hooker Alley. You might find somebody. <laughs> Shaking their butts for the men folk. Exactly. <laughs> There's a woman walking down the street. She's walking down the middle, like the sidewalk, and everyone's kind of looking at her. Because she's dressed like a hooker. (laughs) (laughs) And there's someone driving down the road who's following her. And he hasn't said anything to her. She's just walking along. But everyone else on the sidewalk is yelling out to him. Like, look at these. This, look at that. Look at all these things I'm saying. Sorry. Look Look at these. (laughs) (laughs) Take a look at these ones. (laughs) Meanwhile, someone creepily smiling and watching through a camera is up in a room watching this woman walk down the street. We have a So surveillance or pervert. I'm leaving pervert. <laughs> That's definitely what it looked like. Yeah. But we jump cut and the woman coming in, she's it's the woman that was walking down the sidewalk. She's calling it a night, goes up to the apartment. It's the same room with the man that was taking the pictures. And she's saying like, oh, I just had such a bad night. Like I only made $300. And then she's like, I'm really tired of doing this. So you said I don't have to do it for much longer. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah shut up. Yeah. She's talking <laughs> about like how one guy got really rough. He's like, and she's like, will you rub my neck? He's like, no, I don't got time for that later on. <laughs> He's a really strange pimp because, like, he's on the computer, you know. He's like a, you know, like a '80s hacker or or something, and he's giggling. I I, I actually wrote down in my notes. I, I called him a uh, uh, giggles the pimp. <laughs> <laughs> he will be forever known as giggles. He starts going through the pictures. And we, what we put together here is that. They are specifically looking for people who picked her up that had really nice cars and then running the nice cars through the computer that has been broken into the DMV. 
and then they see who owns it. This case, they happen to find a very nice Maserati with a very friendly rental service because he calls up the rental service and says, they hit me in the parking lot. like, oh, it's this person and they live at this address and here's their phone number. You should go over there and go confront them right now. Seriously, I think we should have taken down the yeah. name of that, <laughs> that rental service because <laughs> don't rent from them. <laughs> Just as a general yeah, They uh, were so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, that's the pimp's name, or we'll call him Giggles from now on. <laughs> Giggles calls Ernesto, says he's got pictures of him picking up a woman as a hooker. I want you to meet me in an alley off of Second Street. That way we can make a deal happen here. So we jump over to the alley. Ernesto is there. He's the person who they called. He shows up. That was the person I was driving the car, too. He's got like a friend with him. He's already got gloves on. So as the viewer, we're like, okay, we know exactly where this is going. Yeah, yeah. very bad sign for Jean- Giggles. Now, when the guy shows up to the meeting with gloves on, I'll tell you, man, he had the scene set. Smoke machines were going, <laughs> had the staircase and everything. <laughs> yeah, I told Dominic that. I'm like, but, what kind uh, of alleyway is this with these smoke machines already going? <laughs> it turns out things go very south for giggles very quickly. <laughs> and for a minute there, I thought he was going to take the hooker for round two. <laughs> Ernesto just walks up the stairs. Goes up to Shane. Shane's kind of laughing and giggling. He shows him the pictures. <laughs> Ernesto lights it on fire. And then another man appears. The partner he was with appears from behind Shane a little bit. Pulls out a gun. Shoots and kills Shane. Walks down to Ernesto. Cinder, the woman, is just watching. No reaction out of her. She's just watching the entire time. He hands the gun to Ernesto. Ernesto takes her scarf, wraps her on the gun to make it quieter, I guess. Shoots and kills Cinder, and then the two men leave, and we go to the opening credits. So now's our chance to check in with our guest stars in this. We've already seen a couple of them, including Lisa Marie, who is hard to miss. We have quite a few guest stars. Let's just start with Ernesto, played by Tony Plana. He played the dad on the TV series Ugly Betty. He was born in Cuba, and he moved to Miami in, in the 60s, but he trained in acting at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. Also is a stage director of a number of product. He's done a number of productions of different Shakespeare work aimed at minority audiences. He also acted in, directed, and wrote for the TV series Hill Street Blues. See, I told you it'd come back up. <laughs> Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Cagney and Lacey, CSI, West Wing, 24, and a few others that I didn't really wreck. Other movies he's been in, An Officer and a Gentleman, Three Amigos, Born in East L.A., Half Past Dead, and he currently teaches at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, and also at Rio Hondo College. Damn, he's been in some really funny movies, mm-hmm. and he teaches at Cal State, Dominguez Hills. <laughs> <laughs> What are you trying to say? I know. (laughs) Our next guest star is Mark Metcalf, who plays DEA agent Brody. From 97 to 2003, he was in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series, and he also was in the spinoff Angel. Uh, He's most known for his role in 1978's Animal House. He played ROTC leader Doug Niedermeyer. He also played a similar character in the Twisted Sister music videos, We're Not Gonna Take It, and I Wanna Rock, as well as the 1996 Tom Arnold movie, The Stupids, (laughs) and in the short-lived ABC sitcom Teen Angel, which only lasted one season. That show name is about what I expected out of Tom Arnold. The movie. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, the movie. It It was bad. It was pretty bad, baby. <laughs> it was stupid. John seen it, though. <laughs> he also had a key role in guess what TV show, guys? Hill Street Blues as oh. Officer Harris. Murder, who was a, actually murdered in the episode Up in Arms. Mark Metcalf also done a lot of good stuff off screen. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go into all of it, though, but a, kudos to him for that. Our next guest star is Oliver Platt, who plays Speedy Styles. Platt's probably one of the guest stars in this. Uh, he was born in Canada to U.S. parents. His dad was a diplomat and an ambassador to Pakistan, Zambia, and the Philippines. His second cousin, once removed, is Princess Diana. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you might recognize him from Working Girl, Three Musketeers, Big Toven, Flatliners, A Time to Kill, Fort Worth. <laughs> 
Worked it in there again. <laughs> I'm keeping it. Keeping it. Paul Worth's going to be in the guest stars or, or music every year, uh, <laughs> uh, every episode until the end. He's going to make it up. Like, yeah, he was in that too. <laughs> he was in that too. Yep, yep. Lake Placid, Men First Class, Benny and June, Bicentennial Man, 2012. Uh, just a ton, a ton of movies. Also had reoccurring roles. He shows West Wing, the series Huff from 2004 to 2006. He was in 40 episodes of The Big C. Uh, and most recently, he was in nine episodes of Chicago PD. Seven episodes of Chicago Fire. And the main cast, it, he's in the main cast on Chicago Medicine. And he did two episodes of Chicago Justice. How the hell many Chicago shows are there? <laughs> well, Why Chicago is Chicago Just- so special? Chicago Justice got canceled. So there's only three. There's Chicago Med, Chicago Fire, and Chicago The PD. only one that matters is goddamn Chicago Justice, and they canceled that because, because it's got Carl Weathers it had in Carl it. Carl Weathers in it, yeah. Got canceled, though. Everyone loved that show. Bastards. Can I get a Seattle cop that doesn't involve zombies? I'm just saying, guys. <laughs> Our next guest star is Lisa Marie, who was a model and actress. She actually was married to Tim Burton before he dumped her on the set of Planet of the Apes in 2001, when he hooked up with Helen Bonham Carter. So uh, she was actually engaged to him from 93 to 2001. So they were engaged for eight years and then he dumped her. She had a small role in Planet of the Apes, by the way. Yeah, I would. I don't know if I was watching Planet of the Apes be made if I'd still want to be married to that director. (laughs) (laughs) she was a feature model for calvin klein she had a small role in woody allen's alice in 1989 and then would go on to do films like ed wood mars attacks Hmm. yeah and and a bunch of tim burton stuff interesting yeah (laughs) so our last guest star is michael de barris actually first appeared in vice as a as part of the rock band power station in the episode whatever works in this episode, he plays Shane Dubois and acting on British TV. His first U.S. role was to serve with love in 67. He got into music at, in 1972. He was in several bands. He had a he wrote a hit song called Obsession with Holly Knight that actually became a top 10 hit for the band Animotion. <laughs> so he toured with a band touring with Duran Duran when he would... Uh, get offered to take Robert Palmer's place as the lead singer of Power Station. He's had reoccurring TV roles in such popular television as MacGyver, Melrose Place, the new WKRP Cincinnati. He's also guest appeared in St. Elsewhere, 21 Jump Street, Nash Bridges and Jag, and he was also in V's Under Siege, Pink Cadillac, and The Goonies. <laughs> and he's been in it like bunch of random stuff bunch of random stuff when we come back from the opening credits we're back at the alley and gina's with the duo the homicide called them because cinder the hooker had been arrested a bunch of times including recently picked up by gina so they have a pretty deep history with her but i guess maybe homicide was just out of ideas on who to call i just think they didn't (laughs) want this case they were like nah it's just being lazy oh it's a dead hooker uh you guys take it (laughs) <laughs> Trudy calls and she has Cinder's address. So now the duo are going to go off and go check in on where she was living, which is like the CD motel. They go in and the duo have a history with their manager too. So like they, like Sunny knows them by first name. Oh, I didn't notice that. I didn't know. And he's like, Hey Sal, thanks a lot. <laughs> like, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week to play checkers. <laughs> Inside, there's a bunch of film hanging from a line. Tubbs sees the computer. It's like, hey, look at this. Like, oh, no, a computer. (laughs) You know what that means. (laughs) I bet they're going to have to get every one of those pictures, too. What is consistent in this episode is that Sunny has all the details. Yeah. Sunny comes over and looks at this computer and goes, oh, they have access to the DMV. And they also have a pretty fancy camera set up here. And look at all these pictures they have lined up. They must have been taking pictures of people and blackmailing them. Like, right away. How did he know that right away? <laughs> Meanwhile, Tubbs is like, look, I'm computer. <laughs> Sunny, look. I'm computer. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Case solved. First ten minutes. Okay, what uh, what are you guys gonna do with the rest of your night? 
Meanwhile, at a boardroom, Ernesto is giving a speech with the DEA, and they're talking to a bunch of other, I think it's South American leaders. And I can summarize. The DEA basically tells everybody, hey, they gave us money for bombs, y'all. And then everyone <laughs> shakes each other's hands, and then they both, and then he, everybody leaves except for the DEA agent who was bragging about getting the bombs, uh, Ernesto, and the, I guess his hot secretary. And yeah, the, the, the DEA agent and Ernesto sit very creepily staring at the secretary <laughs> as I guess it's her job to take down the projector. <laughs> I don't know, but it's it does do the job where it solidifies that Ernesto is this creep. Like, all he can't keep it in his pants. All he wants to do is pursue women. Yeah. And he even says in his little speech when he's talking to, the, to Brody, the DEA agent, at the end of this, like, uh, I think we can work something out. And he's just staring at her. Yeah, and while she was translating for the DA agent, he was looking at her lips, like it focused in on her mouth. Focused on her, yeah. yeah. I see some white people dancing terribly. <laughs> yeah, that was some bad dancing next. <laughs> so Ernesto says, too, that it's impossible to work on Miami while he's looking at her. So he's got a thing for the ladies, and he loves coming to Miami for that particular reason. Although he's there for business for guns, no, no. Ernesto no, no. is there for one reason only. <laughs> the ladies. <laughs> and Brody's like, hey, that's cool. Why don't we meet up at the bar later? Here's a card where where the bar, where we're going to be at. This is the person you want to meet with, too. Over at the precinct, Sonny is talking on the phone. They're following up all the cars that, that they saw in the pictures that were hanging up inside of the... And Sonny's talking to a reverend that <laughs> was one of the pictures that they took. The reverend's driving a Porsche 911 and yeah. picked up picking up hookers he must be one of those big those big mega churches <laughs> he might want to follow back up with that one i yeah. can just say the vice team might want to go <laughs> yeah. check it check back in with that one yeah <laughs> castillo stops by they have no leads other than one person that Tubbs found that didn't have a cover story which he should have said something earlier but he waited for dad like well, just <laughs> such a glory hog like just hiding all the work <laughs> or maybe he's worried that sonny's gonna take credit for it dad says go now don't waste time Go, go. Get, yeah, what are you doing here? Scamper. Go on, get out yeah. here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that night at Woody's Ball, Ernesto and his associates show up. They're looking around. They say that, oh, this person's late. Ernesto scans the room for ladies. He's not looking for their contact. He's looking for the ladies. And he locks onto one, a blonde sitting alone. And I don't know what to think of this. Because I don't know, Melissa, would this ever work? Could anyone ever send someone else over to you and say, hey, see that attractive man over there at the bar? No. He, he wants you. <laughs> No, it was creepy. No. And then, oh, and then, no and it was he, even worse than that. So he comes over there and he's like, he, bas he, he ba basically, without saying, excuse me, are you a hooker? He basically starts offering her money. I'll give you a thousand. Five grand? How's five grand? That's a, that, that's a no. I think that that no. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, then just that, like, and then you, you come over and be like, that's my friend over there. He's very attractive. Do you like him? She's like, no, he's not my type. And then, then okay, well, I'm, I've already insulted you with the type of person you think you should date. <laughs> How about some money? And she's like, no, you couldn't give me a, no, no, no money in the world. And I would sleep with him basically because ladies, i always thought like there would be these times where i would have like a wingman that would go do the ultimate move for me they go over to the over to a table go we'll talk to a woman while standing at the bar how do you work on that pose be like hi how, how do you get the cool <laughs> pose at the bar be like hey so and then i point to you and you're like sup <laughs> he looked like something out of Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> He's Jim Carrey waiting at the bar. The contact that they're there to see, his name's Speed, by the way, Speed Styles, sees what's happening, sends a note with another woman over to Ernesto and says, meet me out back. Stop making a fool of yourself. That lady don't want you. That was really embarrassing. Everyone saw <laughs> yeah, that. Everyone thought, meet me down the street in this very creepy warehouse. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, come on. Secret meetings are the best meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Ernesto shows up out back. He sees Speed. Speed has set up a very nice presentation as if he's at like a um, a show. A he's, got, show. he's got like a booth at a, yeah. at a festival or something. <laughs> yeah, very nice setup. Even a gun on like a rotating display. Yeah, exactly. and, and it's Wiley Willie's Guns, Guns, Guns. <laughs> <laughs> Ernesto is looking for a very specific long list of firearms. 
And then he says at the very end, after they come to terms on their payments, there's a little bit of back and forth on who's going to pay what. And he says, oh, by the way, I also want you to get me some baseballs. As Speed goes, no, no, not baseballs, anything but baseballs. And we're like, what the fuck? Guns, no problem. Baseballs, they're hard to keep in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Ernesto pulls the gun up, pulls a gun up, pulls a clip into it and says, we well, have no choice. Get me my baseballs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Over at the address that they got on the person, the one lead that, that they're going to follow up on, they got an address for it. They show up and it's Ernesto's listed address as from the rental company. They call Trudy and Trudy says that everyone else is checked out. So this is their only lead. This is the only one that, that they can go on. Just then, Ernesto show up. The duo try to follow him into the compound, totally missing the giant sign when security stops them and they flash their badge and security points to the wall and says, Consulate of Chile. <laughs> like, you know, yes. <laughs> this giant sign on the side of the wall right next to the door. They're not the most observant. Uh, okay. <laughs> Someone might need to explain to them, you know, how diplomatic immunity works and sovereign <laughs> soil of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> in true duo fashion uh, we okay he went into this compound we got him when he comes out we can stop him we don't have jurisdiction on because this is sovereign land of chile we have to wait for him to leave we'll catch him when he comes out okay stan you stay here all night we're gonna go home and get some shut eye <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then love when they check in with stan in the morning too <laughs> you know he's like well not much has happened i saw a dog poop like that's about <laughs> it <laughs> He also saw two dogs make love, as he kind of phrases it. He Ew. Said, yeah. What the heck? It's actually someone who'd go over and watch. Yeah. Good job, boy. <laughs> You're doing a real good job. But luckily, as the duo show up and they're talking to Stan, Ernesto happens to be leaving. So when he leaves, they corner him in, in the driveway. He's, he's actually out of the gate, but still like, kind of in the driveway of the consulate. And they pull him out of the car, handcuff him, and start searching. And Sonny's being a major jerk to him, too, the entire time. <laughs> Isn't that Sonny's demo? <laughs> I'm a major jerk to everyone. <laughs> Ernesto says that if this was my country, I would have killed you by now. And Sonny's like, Ernie, you ain't in your country. <laughs> Ernie. <laughs> the ultimate disrespect of nickname that no one asked for. <laughs> Brody inside the consulate sees that Ernesto is getting arrested and they come running over and flash their badges as DEA. And Ernesto is their guest in the United States and an ally to stop the Andean Coke cartels from moving drugs into the U.S. And then my favorite part is in the argument where the DEA says you can't have him. He's under protection from the DEA. Ernesto says, and tell that peasant to give me my gun back. Like, did he just call Sonny a peasant? <laughs> yeah, exactly what he did. <laughs> hey, man, and Crockett is married to a gigantic pop star, man. You better be nice to him. <laughs> tell he's a nobody, I mean, otherwise, but he's married to someone who's famous. <laughs> Tubbs says the DA doesn't have jurisdiction, and so the DA is like, okay, fine. You can interview him tomorrow at 10 a.m. in my office because that's it. That's the only thing that you're allowed to do. I know he's under a murder investigation, but he's under pr our protection. And Sonny and Ernesto really go at each other the entire time in this exchange. Ernesto doesn't have any fear. He thinks that he could just get away with anything. Because he does it in his country. Well, well, to be honest, they don't really have any evidence other than a picture of him hiring a hooker. Yeah, so. that's true. I mean, all they know all they know is he picked up a hooker. They don't have any other evidence. And even then, the photography <laughs> is so bad. All they know is that it's that one car person. that was registered to him yes. picked up a hooker. Yeah, and it's just one person mm -hmm. in the car that comes up later. Like, say, like, well, there was only one person in the car, so it had to be, or whatever, not Ernesto. <laughs> At the precinct, the duo are telling Dad they have very few details. They got a pretty weak case. I mean, they got something that they really need to investigate here because it's a double murder, but not much to work on with Ernesto. And Zwitek says, well, in the rental agreement, the car had a had a phone. And I know we can't get a warrant because he's under protection of the DEA and all the diplomatic stuff to get a wiretap on the consulate of Chile. But we can totally tap his car phone. And not tap it, I mean, like, we can listen in on his calls because they're basically just like radios. And Switek can ease, he throws out some science terms. Switek came prepared. Reminder, Switek's a real cop sometimes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he's their tech guy. Think about that. That might keep you up at night. <laughs> he's your tech guy. I'm curious, though. I mean, really? Old car phones, which were, were basically just glorified radios. In the invention so of people who just jumped around with ham radios in their car. <laughs> with the invention of 
3G and 4G and CDMA, which was in cell phones now, you can't do that anymore. But in original car phones, yeah, they're just radios, which makes you think like, man, you know, it's probably not a good idea for a police officer to use a car phone for official police business then, is it? Yeah, because everyone can listen to that. (laughs) Good thing we don't know any cops who have car phones. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That night at the consulate, Ernesto's on the phone with Brody, the DEA agent. And they're in cahoots. They're going to work out a deal because the DEA protection for Ernesto in the United States, he's going to take $20,000 from Ernesto and he helped hook him up with Speed Styles to do the gun the gun buy. So the DEA agent, Brody, he's just as dirty as everyone else in this. Spoiler, everybody's uh, dirty that's a cop in this, <laughs> in this show. No, 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 everybody's dirty fed. Every <laughs> yeah, fed is exactly. dirty. Are, is anyone surprised that the DEA agent was dirty? I already assumed the fact. I kind of thought the DEA agent was one of the ones was the guy that killed the people <laughs> <laughs> so now the vice team is going to follow ernesto in the van who he, which he's seen already he, he he will recognize that green mystery machine from a mile away we don't need to talk about that plot <laughs> hole don't be bringing bright, that plot uh, hole here <laughs> a big bright green van chasing him around because they have to be so close in the van to pick up the radio signal to hear what he's saying and they're picking it up pretty good actually for being like on the move and stuff it's staticky but they get some key points out of this even though sunny the entire time was like oh, oh, come on stan you gotta do better than this pal i know who this pal he's so <laughs> condescending sometimes but they get some incriminating evidence which will come up here in just a little bit at the precinct the next day they're reviewing the evidence the dad comes in says homicide called they have a related case and so everyone runs out i mean everybody the entire vice team like runs out the door to go check in on this case and they head over to a motel and the vice team shows up i love the setup because they show up and the dea agent's there and he's got a dead guy with a note pinned to his chest that says i did it and he's like see case closed (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nothing nothing to investigate further and then you know suddenly throws out a rather racist chili rayano comment and then we're off <laughs> but i don't think the vice squad bought it though switex tries to argue with brody right before and suddenly's like hey no that's fine we trust the da the da has always done stellar work investigating these kinds of crimes and you see the look on brody's face like oh shit that means they're gonna investigate me now yeah, what well, they didn't pull it off very well. They didn't hide it, especially because Tubbs looks so smug about it all. He's like, "Yeah, we'll be back. Don't worry." Oh yeah, we trust you. We trust you. Back at the precinct, the duo and Switek are listening to the recording, and Sonny is laying out the entire history of why Chile can't buy guns. He happens to know the entire history. He knows everything. Like, how did he know there was an embargo that they couldn't buy from them before until after 1976? He like, goes by <laughs> Wikipedia Brown. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rather informative episode because we get a short scene where uh, basically the DEA agent talks with Ernesto, and basically Ernesto's like, I, "Like, I'm getting out of here tomorrow." <laughs> then we get the realization Sonny realizes that he's trying to buy CBUs or or cluster bombs. And we end up learning the whole history behind CBUs from Sonny and Dad. Yeah, they go. Sonny knows a lot about it, and then they go talk to another. Well, he weapons used them on expert. the Viet- he used them in Vietnam on you know civilians and. Yeah, they said they're for personnel. They, they call them bombies and also baseballs of death. Bing, bing. <laughs> so Dad tells them time's of the essence. Go talk to his weapons experts to find out more about why Ernesto would be interested in cluster bombs. We're going to continue to work information on speed styles to see if there's any connection here because we now know Brody. Sorry, we know individually Brody speed and Ernesto are all involved in this. What's going to tie them all together? The duo go talk to the weapons expert, and apparently cluster bombs have been outlawed in 20 countries because they're sleepers. They stay in the ground for years, and then someone just stumbles on them, and that's what happened to him. That's why he's in the wheelchair. The weapons expert says, I think Ernesto is buying these because the U.S. is the only place that's not band in that also makes the sleeper versions and he's going to take them back to chile then they're going to make them and sell them to the middle east like iran and iraq yep. at the precinct they're running mm-hmm. lead switek found that speed was it's calling ernesto <laughs> he's a pretty good businessman yeah you know he's he understands if he could only you know 
not break hundreds of laws when he goes to other countries to make sure <laughs> that he can get his business but deals done. He's he's very no nonsense. He doesn't leave any loose ends. You no, know? I mean he's he's got a plan. He, he's he's executing. You gotta give <laughs> the guy credit. <laughs> At the precinct. They're running lead. Swyth Tech found out that Speed had called Ernesto. Trudy calls the phone number for the surplus warehouse in Eccles. And then she's confused because she hears the name and then just like, no, sorry, wrong number. And then hangs up. And Sonny's like, that's right next to Eccles Air Force Base and right next to the biggest weapons cache in the South. We should go check this out. He's probably going to buy cluster bomb or get the cluster bombs from there. And we have a montage for- at Eccles military base montage now. Yeah. So when Gina calls him, you know, he basically answers like, Wiley Willie's guns, guns, guns. <laughs> Our montage at Eccles, you see Speed and his crony from Willie or Wiley. Yeah, I think, it's, I think he said Willie. So I don't know. <laughs> they go sneak into the warehouse and steal the cluster bombs. The MPs on the military base are racing kind of leisurely. Yeah, not really the racing. Yeah, that kind of, someone who's breaking into eventually. your arms. <laughs> oh, they just missed them, and they get out using the old broken cheap uh, jeep on a truck trick. You know, <laughs> stupid army falls for it every time. <laughs> And then Speed goes straight to go meet up with Ernesto. They're meeting on the waterfront somewhere. There's lots of these abandoned warehouse areas along the waterfront in Miami, apparently, because we've been to not only abandoned warehouses, but abandoned boat yards and plane yards all along the water. Everything's so. abandoned. There's no, <laughs> no one lives anywhere. <laughs> Speed shows Ernesto's, Ernesto the bombs and it's like, hey, so we got a good deal here because the deal here is that we missed in the, I didn't mention in the, when they decrypt the phone call that they were listening to driving. And not only did they learn that it was for cluster bombs, but they also learned that Speed could deliver the cluster bombs in Miami. He couldn't get them shipped, but the rest of the guns can be shipped straight to Guatemala. So the only thing that they can really investigate Ernesto on is these cluster bombs. But no problem. No problem. He's just going to throw them in his carry-on. He's got a <laughs> flight book for tomorrow. Everything's going the plan. <laughs> and after he makes the deal, he shoots Speedy for good measure. <laughs> oh, just covering all my tracks. You know, Melissa, he's not leaving a trail all over the place. Yeah, no, a trail of dead bodies. And he doesn't even hide Blue them. He leaves them there. <laughs> a note pinned to his crony. Oh, <laughs> I did it. It was my fault. <laughs> See, that's where it gets because the vice squad goes and confronts the uh the- the agent, after they find out that he used to work with Speed at the uh, ATF, and as they start laying it on, by the end of the scene, they fig- he the DA fi- figures out that uh, Ernesto's setting him up for Speed's murder. Not only that, but come on, Brody. Come on. The arms dealer that you set up with Ernesto wired you $5,000. Yeah. Did you think no one was ever going to figure that out? Yeah, it's all over the place. They keep wiring him money and they keep showing up. (laughs) Someone needs to get him a dictionary and point to laundering. (laughs) 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 That's got to go through a couple steps before it gets to you, man. You can't just have him go down to Western Union and say, I'd like to send money to DA agent Brody. (laughs) But see, see, so right now, all they have is the general or someone in the general's rental car hired a hooker. Otherwise, he had someone else kill the hooker and the pimp, and then someone else kill him, and then now he set up the DEA agent to look like he killed Speed. I mean, a good lawyer can get him off of all this. Now he's just got to get on the plane and go. Yeah, he's just got to leave. He's looking at his baseballs. He's very happy with himself. He's like, I'm going to take my balls, and I'm going to get on my chalk airline, <laughs> and I'm going to go home. So the next day, we're at chalk airlines now. Before before we talk about this scene, I have some questions. One, we've talked about this before on Miami Vice. You can just get on international flights that fly, like, take off off the water and just leave the United States. Like, that's a thing. And those that's tiny planes in the too. 80s. Like, that, that would throw me off as a big on those little it's planes. Just, it's, chalk, it's chalk airlines as in chalks. Like, it, that's someone's name. It's just a pilot who owns a plane. Yeah. He flies international flights. <laughs> Out of some yeah, random area in Miami. This is a guy who's a general in the army in Chile. He's a diplomat and he's flying Bob's Airlines out of <laughs> whatever swamp they're taken off out of. The next question I have is when Ernesto shows up, there's a cyclone fence. That's it. That and then you walk onto the tarmac. Yeah. And this was in a previous episode where I brought up all these same questions. Yes, because it was the same thing. They just yeah. took off on a plane. <laughs> Ernesto walks up and just shows and his I was ticket. Right. 
<laughs> Ernesto just walks up and shows his ticket, and the stewardess waiting at the side cone gate is like, okay, yeah, good, go ahead. No ID, no bag checking, no metal detector, nothing. You even got to keep his shoes on. <laughs> Melissa, you recently flew. Just keep in mind that back in the 80s, he just walked on with a suitcase of bombs. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was right. Not only is that his carry-on, he didn't even change up. It's still in that like steel briefcase. Yeah, exactly. When it's I just flew just there with a lady- bomb on the side. <laughs> yeah, I know. When I just flew there with a lady who had a water bottle in her bag that she forgot about, and like four TSA agents were like, "You need to step aside, ma'am. <laughs> you need to go through your stuff." But this guy's got bombs, and he's just going to go on his water plane and fly away. He didn't even have to show his ID. No, that's how it was. You could be anybody in the eighties and fly. <laughs> He also came by a cab. He covered all his tracks. Yeah, really. I mean, you know, you had to pay for the cab somehow and, <laughs> and order it and have it come pick you up. Well, <laughs> first, he had to drop off the Maserati at the rental place. And then you <laughs> have to get on. And, and, you know, they have those shuttles, but, you know, they're like every 20 minutes. And who wants to wait? Just catch a cab. <laughs> Also, he murdered his driver, so you know true. there's a problem with that. <laughs> so Ernesto goes up and starts waiting in line, and the vice team is spread out all over the place. They are the worst people at hide and seek, especially Switek. I was gonna say, <laughs> what are you gonna call out? <laughs> Cowboy Tub? There's Switek. <laughs> because he looks over his shoulder and sees Switek standing in the corner holding his radio. <laughs> <laughs> he never learned to do magic, okay? He's still trying. <laughs> He cannot blend in. They have him surrounded, and he puts together like, oh, no, I am surrounded. Dad told some other officers to tell the pilot, hey, this is what's going on. The pilot waves off the worker, too, that's putting the fuel into the plane. He's like, hey, hold on a second. Like, There's something else that's going to be here right now. Ernesto eventually realizes, I got to do something about this. He takes a hostage, points the gun at the briefcase, says, I will blow all of us up. Everyone backs off except for Tubbs. Tubbs keeps Ernesto at gunpoint as he slowly backs with the hostage up to the air, gets on with the pilot, no, and no, takes no, no, off. No, 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 no. I want to stop and correct you here. You said everyone backs off but Tubbs. I kind of think that it's a little different. Everyone stays out of range of the explosion except <laughs> Tubbs <laughs> is a more accurate statement. <laughs> he gets on the plane and starts to take off. And... The ice team's just watching him fly away, and this is going to be the end. And then the maintenance worker comes up. He's like, greatest yeah. vice criminal ever. <laughs> Everything went to plan. He murdered yeah. anyone that could rat on him. He's heading back with his dirty bombs. Yep. This is it. This is done. And maintenance worker comes up, gets his hands on his hips. He's like, ah, well, it's too bad. There's no fuel in that plane. They're not going to get very far. And dad's like, huh? What? <laughs> At first, I was like, oh, man, that went, that hostage is for a ride. <laughs> 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 I said that too. I'm like, I guess no need to worry about that poor hostage. She's going to end up in Chile. <laughs> Dad radios over to Sonny, who's in his boat. Now, I have a question. This is my last question on this airport scene. <laughs> why why, Sonny in the why boat? was Sonny in the boat? Because he was going to chase after him if he got why? in the water somehow. <laughs> he could be trying to drive that plane out of there. <laughs> I guess you might say the last time we had this. He was going to chase that plane all the way back to Chile. <laughs> You might say the last time we had this scenario, they did the same setup. It was all the exact same setup. And the person took a hostage and then ran and jumped on a boat and tried to escape on boat. So they had to catch him. They knew what could happen, the potential. So he had to be out there. Also, like, what if he took the plane that taxi for a really long time in the water? He could cut it off with the boat. Which mm-hmm. makes the what makes the question why didn't he then? Because it was in the water for a long time so before they he's realized just there hanging out yeah. before they realized that it didn't have any gas in it, right? Because the taxi so was long, and then the guy came up and said, "Like, hey, by the way, I didn't put any fuel in that thing. It's not going anywhere." So why wasn't Crockett like right I wasn't there trying to do my job? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I guess what's left other than the plane to land. And him to steal a boat so we get a boat chase montage. <laughs> I feel really bad for this person because the plane like just takes off, turns around and lands. Like that's how little fuel that it had. This good Samaritan sees the plane land and goes over to go help the plane. It's just some old guy out there fishing. Yeah, he's just fishing and he pulls up and Ernesto shoots and kills him and then pushes his body into the water and steals his boat. And then there's this chase Why montage. Why the hostage? I know. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. What happened leverage? to the hostage? Where's the hostage in the plane? Got to still be on the plane. Oh, okay. That's now out of fuel. It's just kind of drifting okay, but I think, with the Rastafarian. I think it needs to be, <laughs> I think it needs to be addressed. 
that when he opens up the plane, it's clearly not Ernesto that pokes out with a gun <laughs> because Ernesto was not wearing a white suit. No. And this person was wearing a white suit. No. And then the person in the white suit continues to drive the boat. Yes. Because it's, as I'm to understand, it's a recording that they did for an episode in season one that they didn't use, which might be the same episode we're talking about. Yeah. So it was another <laughs> ending that uh-huh. they didn't use because it's uh-huh. clearly like, well, my, what did he do? Change outfits while we were there? He also huh. gave Sonny a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm just confused. So Sonny's like chasing him in, in, in the montage, you know, the boat chase. And then just randomly, he loses control of the boat, jumps the boat, crashes on the island, and blows up. Well, I mean, Finn. he's got the bombs with him, right? End so that's probably why he blew up. But why was there a ramp? See, I have a theory. Jump? I have a theory, too. But how about you start, and then I'll, I'm, I'm going to fill it in. Okay. So far, this guy has been pretty on point with his plan. He's been willing to kill anyone who got in his way. When he jumps out of the plane without the hostage, I mean, he loses his leverage. So I'm thinking, he's got to still have a plan. When we see the boat go off the jump, we don't see him in the boat. We just see the <laughs> boat go up and then land on what? He had a bunch of bombs. What if he took one bomb, left it in the boat, dove off in the last minute with his bombs, and then the, let the boat jump and then crash on the island and blow up? Everyone thinks he's dead. And he Sonny's just, just going well enough to think he's dead. Yes. I think Sonny would see him if he jumped out while the <laughs> boat was jumping. Also, when, I don't he, when think the boat so. they've lands, struggled with surveillance in the past. <laughs> no, no, but when the boat lands, when it does the jump and it lands in the water, there, there's a guy in it because that's why I was like, that guy's wearing a white suit. Why is he wearing a white suit and has long <laughs> hair? <laughs> Here's my theory on this: You ever played Grand Theft Auto and you have like five stars, right? And you're trying to escape and you're in a boat and you're 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 trying to escape. You got you're down to just one cop following you and you're gonna get away. But you see out of the left corner of your eye, there's a boat ramp. Exactly. And you're like, that's one of the jumps I haven't hit yet. <laughs> I, I should hit this jump. <laughs> and then it totally backfires. And then you're and then dead. you die. And then you wake up in the hospital and you have to redo that mission. <laughs> that's pretty much what happened. He couldn't resist. There was already that ramp set up for whatever reason. It's ramp number seven of 300. <laughs> like, he's trying to hit them all. <laughs> it freeze frames on the explosion. And that's the end of the episode. That's it. Yeah, like and it was like on set they're like, oh, shit, we got to end this. Nah, not really. Just blow them up. <laughs> I think we got some leftover stuff from season one we could use. <laughs> Just use that. And that's this episode. I'm gonna save my final thoughts because I don't want to give anything away here. But I, and I'm encouraging all of us to save them. Let's all surprise everyone with what our final thoughts are on this episode because we're gonna turn the mind vice world <laughs> upside down. I think is how it's gonna go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but let's go talk about this week's music. It's uh, it's deeper than what we got last week by just a few. Let's go talk about the, this week's music. All right, John. We literally had one song last week. We and then a week before that, we had theme songs. They got to do better this week, right? They do in a sense. We got four different songs by four different people. No so we, way. We're already starting off better. <laughs> let's start with the first song in the episode pump up the volume by mars or m slash a slash r slash <laughs> r slash s i don't know how you pronounce that with that many slashes in it honestly <laughs> there is so many subdirectories uh it's so fine just gotta grep out what i'm looking for to see where it is uh nerd jokes someone out there will get it <laughs> Tweet at me. Tweet at me at Dom Corvo. Let me know if you got <laughs> Mars is a collaboration between the groups AR Kane and Colorbox. They only released one double sided single. The name is an acronym of the first letters of each of the members' names. AR Kane and Colorbox both signed to the same label, 4AD. The owner of 4AD, the founder of 4AD was Ivo Watt Russell. He actually is the one that suggested that they team up together after both bands pitched an idea to do a dance, a more dance album. So, but things didn't go so well once they got to production. Uh, uh, In fact, the bands uh, didn't get along so much that they ended up splitting them up, giving them each one song to work on individually, and then they would trade songs 
and then basically the other person's song and add to it. And the results were you had Colorbox came up with Pump Up the Volume. At AR came, added, basically added some guitar to, and then DJ Chris CJ McIntosh added some scratches. And a ton of samplings, like 40 samplings. Uh, it's just the Beastie Boys. And AR, <laughs> and AR Kane came up with the song Anatina, in which Fox proceeded to put a bunch of heavy ass drums to. Color Box didn't want to release with Anatina. They actually wanted to release Pump Up the Volume under their name, Color Box, uh, on its own single. They didn't want to have anything to do with AR Kane. Russell. Founder of the label overruled them and put the two back to back A side, B side. And it actually destroyed the relationship with the band Color Box. They actually never worked uh, with 4AD again. Mm. So, song actually, so huge surprise, the song and the Tina didn't do very well. They kind of <laughs> bombed. But, pump up the volume. Shot up the charts. It was actually it was number one in UK, Canada, New Zealand, US. It was really big. And actually, it was number one in the US after they re-released it because they had some legal issues over some of the many samplings released in the song. And it's actually kind of silly. I looked at all the different things. They, they sampled James Brown and all of these different artists and everything. And what they actually got sued over was seven seconds of an anonymous voice moaning the word, hey. <laughs> it was originally from something called Roadblock, and they agreed to remove it in the re-released version. But many believe that it was just a ploy to basically sandbag the song because the person who was behind the lawsuit was also involved with Greg Isley's Never Gonna Give You Up, which was also topping the charts at that same time. You know, it sounds an awful lot like my YouTube channel, too. I got so many takedown notices. Get off my back, MCA. <laughs> so, as you could probably imagine, the two groups never collaborated again. There was never anything else ever made by Mars. <laughs> <laughs> song is 20 killer hurts 20 killer hurts by gene loves jezebel gene loves jezebel british rock group formed in the early 80s by identical brothers jay and michael aston the name of the band actually refers to the musician gene vincent and his song jezebel oh, okay they were many 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 different members of this band. the original incarnation of the band saw ian hudson on guitar even Davis on bass with a drummer named Snowy White. <laughs> I so wanted to learn more about Snowy White, the drummer, but he, alas, <laughs> he does not have his own Wikipedia. <laughs> Snowy White, if you're out there, contact us. John will write your Wikipedia page and maintain it for you. I will. I promise. <laughs> From 81 to 85, they just, there was just a ton of lineup changes. <clears throat> they had released three albums, and they'd seen some success. And then their fourth album came out, a little bit more of a dance album, and featured a song called Motion of Love, which graced the U.S. charts, but, was, but ended up being their biggest U.K. hit, reaching the n number 56 on the uh, U.K. charts. <clears throat> so from 90 to 97... Michael Aston, he would leave the band briefly to, to, to do some solo projects. The rest of the band with Jay Aston would continue. They'd release two albums along with a hit, their hit Jealous, which would become their biggest U.S. hit, reaching number 68 on the Hot 100 and number one on Modern Rock. But their album, Heavenly Bodies, though doing very well in Portugal, incredibly well in Portugal. <laughs> wouldn't do very well because their U.S. label, Savage Records, would collapse financially, and so it wouldn't really be released uh, or distributed in the U.S. much. Their lack of, record, of a record label in the U.S. forced the band into somewhat of a hiatus. In 93, after the hiatus, Mike and Jay reformed Gene Loves Jezebel. They weren't totally serious with it because they reformed the band, but Jay would still perform acoustic solo shows. 
Mike would do side projects with members of the band Scenic, and he would form a band called Immigrants, which would eventually be renamed Edith Grove. But they pretty much spent most of the mid-90s sporadically working together until 97, when Jay and Mike had a falling out during a reunion tour. It was so bad that Mike actually left the tour and Jay would have to finish solo. <laughs> this, this is where things get this is where things get a little funny. So Mike decides all right, guys, screw you, I'm going home. And then he starts his own version, Gene Loves Jezebel. So now there's two Gene Loves Gene <laughs> loves Jezebel. There's Mike's version and Jay's version, which has the original band member, so, or maybe a, an original band member and whatever other band members they had hired at, at the time. It, 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 it's confusing. <laughs> so for a while, they perform as two different bands uh, eventually jay and the uh, and the rest of his band would sue for use their name for copyright infringement and after a prolonged court case jay would uh, and the band would drop the suit essentially coming to the agreement mike's version would be the u.s version and Jay's version would be the UK version, even though they would both tour in the US and UK, vice versa, you know. <laughs> After all that, it came up once again in 2008, when this time Mike sued Jay and eventually was settled by them determining that in the US, Mike's band would be known as In Loves Jezebel, but Jay's band would be Jay's ver Jay's UK G version of Gene Loves Jezebel. <laughs> Whereas in the UK, Jay's, no, I'm not making this up. Jay's band would be known as Gene Loves Jezebel. <laughs> Whereas Mike's would be known as Mike's US version of Gene Loves Jezebel. <laughs> Just to make things completely clear, I'm pretty sure they're still making music. Let's move on to Breakaway by Big Pig. <laughs> this name. Big Pig is an Australian <laughs> funk rock band from uh, that. <laughs> Big Pig. Big Pig. Uh, they, they're, <laughs> they were formed in 85 <laughs> and lasted until 91. This is a weird band, dude. Big Pig was inspired by Japanese haiku drummers. And so the band was formed to have eight or nine drummers drumming all orchestrated together. So literally the band was made up of a vocalist uh, and drummer, drummer, a, a, a vocalist and harmonica player, a keyboardist, a few more drummers, and a couple more drummers. No <laughs> guitars. The bass, no guitars. Drums, harmonica, keyboards, that's it. <laughs> Their first record would see success on the in the uh, Aus in Australia and New Zealand on the dance scene, and they would adopt a uh, signature look, wearing black waterproof aprons, similar to like a Bournemouth style. Their album hit the U.S. Their first album would also chart up to number sixty on the Hot 100. They would soon after tour the U.S. Their popularity was really going strong. Their song Money God was the theme for BBC's Def 2's Rough Guide show. This song Breakaway was also used at the beginning of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Mm. And then their second album came out and it kind of got lukewarm reception. They toured a little bit more and then just abruptly disbanded in April 1991. After they broke up in 91, I mean, you know, uh, only releasing two albums. In the aftermath, one guy went solo, another one played in some other bands, another guy joined an 80s nostalgia group, but nothing big. No one, no one really made it famous or anything. So our last <laughs> song is Running on the Rocks by Shriekback. Shriekback, by the way, also appeared in the episode of Knock Knock Who's There. So we've already met Shriekback before. They're an English thought, rock band. Yeah, I thought they sounded familiar, but I couldn't put my finger on it. <laughs> yeah, they're an English rock band, and they were formed from the members of former band XTC and Gang of Four. Essentially, they formed a one. They released five albums with some success. One of the founding members would go back to uh, the band Gang of Four after that. They would split up in 88, and then they would reform in 92, release two more albums. So-so results. Then they will not release anything until 2003, and then since 2003, they're just 
still making music, but I mean, they're not like, they're not blowing up the charts or anything. They got consistent radio play, I'm assuming, but I mean, just no real, nothing really big as far as hits, even though they released 14 studio albums. <laughs> <laughs> no hits in 14 but, studio albums. <laughs> But Michael Mann apparently is a big fan, seeing as he's used several songs in his projects Manhunter and Band of Hand, as well as being used a few times in Vice. There you have it. Our music. Just random bunch of pretty much <laughs> one-hit wonders and half-famous nobodies. You know, as a fan of metal music, when someone says there's not enough guitars on stage, I tend to agree. There can always be more guitars, but Gene loves Jezebel. Or is it? No, it's Big Pig. Big Pig likes to say, "I got you. Big pig. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get you so many drummers that <laughs> there can never be enough drummers. We're just gonna keep adding them." <laughs> I mean, I kind of want listen to more Big Pig now because I kind of want to see how they coordinate nine drummers on the same stage. <laughs> I guess it's got to be chaos. I'm also disappointed in Miami Vice fans in the '80s. They should have made Shriek back a bigger thing. Like, you all should have banded <laughs> together, made sure that you supported Michael Mann. Like, he put him in everything. Yeah, come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. We've been holding it a secret. Time for the secret to be revealed. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Your secret final My thoughts? My secret. <laughs> well, going into this episode, I mean, obviously, I've seen it before, but it's, it's not, I, I mean... Going into it, I didn't really remember it that well, but I had heard a bunch of people talking about it. You know, the fans, the fans, the Miami Vice fans saying that they didn't like it and it was a bad episode and it was a mess and everything. I don't agree with that. I think it's a little bit maybe slow in some parts, but other than that, I thought it was a really good episode. The only thing that bugged me was like we talked about was that Crockett knew everything before it was said. So it's like, what are you cheating? You got like cliff notes on this? You going home and studying? Are you doing your job? <laughs> going home and studying on <laughs> things that go on other places? And obviously, I always feel like when he does it, he doesn't know anything. So it's like he's supposed to be a better cop than Tubbs because Tubbs didn't know these things. But uh, other than that, I think it's a good episode. It has an ending, a beginning. <laughs> <laughs> There's an ending. Somebody blows up, even if it's not the right guy in that, in that boat. It's questionable whether he was really in that boat. Now we have a conspiracy theory. See? Listen to us for conspiracy theories on who was in the boat. See? <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? I love this episode. This episode was awesome. Uh, Ernesto was a great bad guy. Speedy's character was pretty cool. We had full involvement from the entire Vice squad. And, and the episode ran smoothly. Like, like we got the different parts of the investigation. Bad guy's plan made sense for, for once, which was fantastic. <laughs> Everything was going so strong through the episode. The only thing that really could have been better was that they kind of just cheaped out on the ending. We got all the way to the point where Ernesto was in the plane, and then Vice was like, I got nothing. If we could just replace the last two minutes from the, the plane running out of fuel and landing, like, from there until the boat explodes, if we just re rewrite that, like, this would be the best episode of the season so far. Damn, those are some pretty strong <laughs> words. <laughs> I don't have much to add here. Come at us, Miami Vice fans. <laughs> <laughs> We're ready for you. We liked it. <laughs> I defend. Melissa doesn't go with us, but I defend our love of Noogie. I do not. I hate And that Noogie. comes at, to the <laughs> chagrin of many of our listeners who do not understand our love for the Nook Man. We are that is a good episode. Strong, strong guest stars, diverse music. I mean, I think we hit all every every point yeah yeah so i'm i'm saying it right here we like baseballs to death what's up <laughs> internet <laughs> that <didn't sound> right. <laughs> we like this episode i liked it it had a like the bad guy was a real bad guy and he was trying to play the diplomatic community and they had to do some real police work to bring him in and the whole it took the whole vice team to be able to do it and like they had some ups and downs like they thought they were going to get him and then it slipped through their fingers and then they had to figure out how to go back after him the only problem was why was sunny sitting out in that boat <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and where did that like ramp come knew. from <laughs> <laughs> why'd you set that ramp up sunny doesn't make any sense <laughs> but otherwise this is a good episode of miami vice you heard it 
<laughs> we all agree. <laughs> Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know how crazy we are. Let us know what you think about this episode. We heard going into it. Now, look, this is not Cows of October. That is a terrible oh, yeah, episode of TV. Episode. Not just the Miami <laughs> Rice. TV in general was generally embarrassed by that episode. <laughs> but we had heard baseball's the death wasn't supposed that good. And, and you know what? Maybe we're clouded. Season four has clouded our judgment. Let us know what you think. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at go with the heat. Instagram at go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat. You can find all of those ways. You can contact us and let us know what your real thoughts are. I want to hear it. Email me. Let me know. I want to hear what your thoughts are on Baseball to Death because your Go With The Heat podcast is saying it's a good episode of Miami Vice. I want to hear from you. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website. Go with the heat.com. You can find any of the other ways to contact us, all the other podcatcher platforms out there. And you know what? Go to that podcaster platform of choice give us the highest ranking that you can because you know that helps people find the show and helps us out shows that you support us but talk about how what your feelings are on the exact episode of baseball's death because no one reads the reviews that people leave on podcasts go on there and talk about what your stance is on baseball's of death i want to hear from you Check out that website, email us, go through to gmail.com. Give us a review on your podcast, the platform of choice. And be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.